This is episode eleven, part two of the interview with Jorge Bueno. Hi, my name is Leon Garrelian, and this is the Thriving Life Club, the podcast for those who want to thrive in every area of life. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the club. Let's begin. Welcome back to the second portion of our interview with Jorge Bueno. In the part one, we got to know him better. We found out about this poor Mexican kid who had to deal with negative beliefs of others and his own in order to become successful, and the things that he did and why he did those things. During this episode, let's talk about more in detail about the things that he does on a daily basis and the stuff that he does for fun. Jorge, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. I'm looking forward to it. And we've had a nice discussion so far, and I think we should dig a little deeper, but also from a different angle so that uh, ultimately your listener gets the maximum value from our session. You know, some people probably wonder, how does your day look like? You know, how do you make sure that your day is productive and you're not drifting off course? In my days, it's pretty predictable, man. Um, I can tell you that it's very different now than what it was, you know, when I was first starting out. Um, when I was first starting out, it was, it was, hey, man, I'm up and I need to start the grind and the hustle, man. I'm up and I'm either off to a job or I'm, I'm off doing stuff. And I, you know, there's no chance for me. There's no alone time. There's no chance for improving myself. And so for the past, I don't know, so many years, man, uh, over 10 years, uh, over 15, over, wow, long time, man. I mean, I've been with my, with my lady for 13 years now. And so my day now has to do with making her coffee and being with her and hanging out with her because she's a physical therapist. So she goes to see uh, patients. And during the day, she specializes in, in helping families that have children with special needs. And so she'll do some work with a local school district to help out the, uh, those kiddos. Cause that's her, that's her love. That's what she studied uh, for the pediatrics. And then uh, she'll also do law enforcement, uh, rehab, you know, for guys that get banged up on the job or ladies that get banged up on the job and are doing rehab. So my world revolves around making sure that she's good and she's, she has everything she needs and she's, uh, she's set up for success in every way. And so I, I like to get up and make her coffee. I like to drink coffee with her and hang out and, whether it's a nice cappuccino uh, or a Nespresso or, uh, you know, just a, a nice little cup and just hanging out, man, and, and, and enjoying the morning. And then once she takes off and she goes off to see uh, her patients, then I switch. I switch from being the uh, loving husband that wants to cater to his woman. I switch into the kitty cat, which is her little baby, right? Making sure the kitty cat is, is taken care of. But then I switch to business mode. Luckily, at this point in my life, I don't have to report to an office at a certain time because there's people in place that help me, office staff, managers, on-site managers at apartment buildings, asset manager to oversee properties. So I don't really have to do a lot on the daily basis in order for my business to continue to generate income and revenue, but I do become involved. So I, I will spot check and show up to properties. I will go into the uh, management office to make sure everyone's, you know, doing an okay job and make sure they have what they need to make sure that we're serving our residents the right way. So we run apartment buildings. That's the primary gig. So we have a lot of residents and, you know, there's pools, there's jacuzzis, there's gyms inside these buildings. There's issues with landscaping, you know, there's roofs and, you know, maintenance requests. And so there's a lot. And so even though, like I said earlier, there are people that can just take care of that while my lady and I goof off and do stuff. I found out, you know, so many years back that life can become a little meaningless if you just have nothing to do. And so once we had these systems in place and I was just like, okay, well, I don't need to go there because everything's good. I mean, there's people watching that. I don't need to go over there. Hey, I'm just going to focus on myself. So I just would focus on like personal trainer and hitting the gym and all that. And then that became kind of stupid. I was like, well, what am I doing here at the gym from like nine in the morning till like noon? And then most of the day is burned now, right? And then, um, you know, I go back, okay, where am I going to have lunch? All right, great. I'm going to meet my lady. So then it kind of became this, this weird, and I would always complain uh, about this in the past. I'd always look at people when I would drive by like Beverly Hills and stuff. I would always complain and think to myself, 
what the hell are these people doing here? Why? What are all these people doing here at three o'clock having wine with their lunch on a, on a Tuesday, you know, on a Friday? And then I find myself becoming that person, right? This very same person who I would like, not, not, it's, it wasn't a complaint. It was an observation and it was more of a nagging request. Like, can I do that too, please? And so the very same person that I would analyze and why are you drinking at, you know, man, on a Tuesday, man, what's going on? And that I ended up becoming that person, right? So the thing is you have to have a higher calling to serve others or to improve yourself or to improve the livelihood of your people, because otherwise it's going to get a little bit boring, man. So currently I'll get up, I'll do spot checks on properties. I will hit the office. I will absolutely hit the gym. Um, my lady and I, we fluctuate on our workout schedules. I know that a lot of like gurus or a lot of people that are out there, you know, excelling in life, they'll tell you, I work out, I do this, I do that. The truth is when we work out early in the morning, it's the best, man. I would uh, encourage anyone listening, if you have an opportunity to work out early in the morning, that's going to be the best. My, we have a private concierge doctor and he taught us uh, years back that it's something called afterburn. So if you're trying to get that physique that you desire, that you're, you know, drooling over on Instagram models and so forth, and that's something that you like, you're, atta- you're looking to attain a nice figure, whether you're a man or, you know, or a female. And he says you want to work out early because your body continues to burn calories throughout the day, but you have to give it a good head start. See, my lady and I, we used to work out at night, man. You'd find us at the home gym or even going to the regular gym at like midnight. And then we wouldn't get to bed till three. It was just goofy. So we've gone through many, many cycles of being a night owl to um, ultimately now is getting up early, rising strong, rising with a purpose and with a passion and with a huge smile. And I'm basically like, I'm, I'm in bed, right? And we have this wonderful Tempur-Pedic, huge bed that is so comfortable. But sometimes at five in the morning, at six, I, you know, I get, I sit up and I'm like, I'm done with this, man. I'm done. I don't need it. I don't need it no more, homie, right? Like you're done with it. Like you don't, there's no reason uh, to continue there, right? And so we get up and, and my lady has the, uh, it's called Peloton. It's a little stationary bike with a TV on it. So she hops on the Peloton and she'll, you know, do a workout and I'll, I'll do one. And then you know, she'll hit some weights. We have a home gym. So she'll hit up weights or um, there's a strength trainer that we have. It's like a wall unit that has a different modular exercises. And so we'll do our own little circuit to get our blood going. And then um, we still have a gym membership, so we'll still go to do the big weights, like the squats and things like that. But not always can we do that in the morning, but I would say that our best days are usually so wonderful when we're able to get that out of the way in the morning workout. So I do encourage your listeners to get a workout in nice and early, you know, before work, or if you, you know, have to travel to a metropolitan downtown city or something, you know, get to that area early because you're going to bypass all the traffic then hit the gym and then just shower at the gym, right? And then, uh, or just go to work stinky, who cares? Uh, but, you know, get dolled up at the gym, you know, get ready for work at the gym. You're going to thank yourself, man, because, you know, my, our concierge doctor also uh, was talking to us about cortisol levels and about sleep levels and how today's society is, uh, you know, sleep deprived, even though they feel that they, they can function with, you know, six hours or four hours rest, uh, your body internally is breaking down by not fully resting your body the full seven to eight hours and so anyway, I visit properties during the day and I get to work. I, when, I, when I hit the office, I work on my personal stuff uh, in terms of my business codex material and structuring my flow for new classes. We're developing classes for my lady as well in terms of um, she loves guns, right? Firearms. So she's developing an online platform class for um, gun safety. And right? we call her the urban survival chick. So we're going to be uploading some gun safety trainings to help uh, empower people that, you know, can't get to a range or don't know the first thing to do, or, and maybe they just want to know some basic fundamentals on like, what is this part of the gun? What is that? What does that do? What is this called? You know, how does this function? So that's what she's doing. So we've been working a lot on that, on, on her flow and her structure for that. And most importantly, the middle of my day from like 10 AM to like 3 PM is money, 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 making sure that everything we're doing uh, in our apartment business continues to be a okay so that we can expand, acquire other properties and uh, also make sure that our current residents are, their needs are met and everyone's happy, including our employees. And so after about three o'clock, I'm back on my own goofing off again, right? Th- this is my time to wait for my lady. I meet up with her. Uh, she's done with patients right around that same time. And then our lovely 
loving romantic time begins and this is daily so this is when you know we get together and we hang out and we just are you know little lovebirds all over again and it's not like this cheesy thing where like oh it's you know some people call it relationship building time or um relationship improvement session it's like no nah, dude come on what it is is uh you know we just we love to hang out with each other and that's when we go to our private business club that's where you know we go enjoy a nice cigar which is something that I know you enjoy and I like that topic too and my lady smokes as well and she has her own little cigar kit and you know her fancy lighters and cutters and she has great skills and knows how to and knows how to you know light properly and and all that good stuff so for the most part after 3 p.m. it's just family time you know hanging out with uh, my son hanging out with my wife and and just enjoying everything we've become i think so many times leon people work too hard and they work too late and they work too hard to really enjoy uh, everything they're building. And it's sad, man. I, I see it all the time. And um, I, I don't, I don't, I, I see why people do it uh, because they're hungry for the U S federal reserve note and they want to have more of it. And I, you know, I understand that, but at the same time, I see them missing out on the simple things like, you know, meeting up with your wife and, and, or your significant other or a friend or a business colleague and, you know, taking a nice hike or enjoying nature or enjoying yourselves and just breathing deeply and, you know, going to a, a, either a Bible study or a, a Kabbalah lecture or following up on, uh, our, you know, my Masonic teachings or reading an, a good book and just sitting in the backyard under a tree and uh, with a cigar lit and just, you know, reading, even though, uh, my lady and I are both reading something totally different. We're just together, man. And, you know, our, our souls are there. It's kind of cool. Uh, so here's the moral of what I'm saying right now. I think that if, if you're driven by success and what you believe success is, which means hustle and grind and money and all that, there's a, you know, some gurus that teach that, you know. Um, I believe that that's excellent as long as you realize that there should always be time to enjoy the present and to enjoy everything you have up until now. So if you're, I, cause I used to be at the office till 10 PM man. I, I was one of those dudes. I, I was one of the guys where, you know, it, it was, it was midnight and I was at the office and my lady would say, Hey, uh, and she's sleeping in one of our recliners or on one of the couches in the office. Right. And she's like, Hey, can we go now? And this was me like, okay, I'm going to bend. Let me bang this out. Sudi. I got to do this proposal. I got to do this offer tomorrow. We're going to go see this property. It's a, it's a new opportunity. And after a while, I'm just like, you know what, man, it is not that important because there's people for that. So people should be doing your logistics so that by the time you look at a, a proposal or a document or a, or a real estate offer, you know, it's done. You know, your attorney's done it. You know, there's, all you're doing is approving the final price and whether you want to pay that price or not. And that's it. I mean, why are we driving ourselves nuts and missing out on, you know, the beautiful part? You know, we don't live that long, man. We live like, what, 85 years of age? Um, maybe give or take, uh, if, if all conditions are pretty good, ladies tend to outlive guys in general. And so I think for the most part, as a, a successfully minded individual, um, you should make time in your day to cultivate your mind, body, spirit connection with those that you love. And also, uh, you know, with your own body temple, you know, feed your body, nourish it, eat good food, get a good workout, take care of yourself so that you can actually be around and be healthy to enjoy all those riches that you're working so hard to attain. Yeah, you know, I, I know your listeners, for, for them, it makes sense. Absolutely. And so bearing in mind everything you just mentioned, I know you've been there in that hustle and grind mode. What would be your number one advice to that person who's currently building their first company, for example, or they're building their side hustle, they're in that mode? What would your advice be to getting out of that mode as soon as possible and finding balance between making Benjamins and having fun and enjoying life. The first thing I would say to people is uh, you must have your projections of income and revenue in place because if you don't have uh, waypoint markers as to when you can consider yourself to be successful, then you can just drive yourself nuts and you can drive yourself and you can continue to work uh, in a crazy amount of hours without really having any benchmarks in place. So make sure that you have benchmarks and, and a checklist in place with projections as to where you're going to be in terms of revenue so that you can consider yourself, whew, wow, good. Okay. All the bills are paid. All of the fees are paid. Taxation is in place. It's all paid. Okay. No problem. I can rest. 
breezy right now and I can relax and I can, you know, re- reward myself with a nice business trip and, you know, go do some market research and to increase my business and, uh, or other products and do it that way. So what I mean to say here is if you don't have a goal as to where you will quote unquote be rich or quote unquote be wealthy or consider yourself to be independently, you know, debt free, then you won't really know when to stop. Right. So if you have enough money to purchase the new S class Mercedes, uh, you know, 1500 bucks a month and you can make that payment with a breeze because anyone with a regular job can make that payment. But if you find your, if you believe you're successful with that and you can stop there, well, then that's good. Right. If that's how you equate it based on your car, which is, I think, kind of goofy. But for someone that I guess wants to drive around town and be perceived as someone who might be successful and that's where you end. So as long as you have enough money to pay all your necessary essentials, then you're good to go, right? You can rest now. But I believe that people should have a 10-year cycle of success in terms of uh, projection. So I would like people to have two years of money set aside as a financial cushion so that for two years, if you did nothing, all your bills, all your taxes, all your uh, fees, all your employees, everything could be met with your financial cushion. And only then would I say that you're okay financially to rest a little bit easy and to kind of goof off a little bit in life, right? But I would say the first thing is people need to get to two years worth of expenses to consider yourself successful. So so often, Leon, I see people that are parading themselves to be the success. And I know that if they, you know, they're probably three months away from being bankrupt, but because everything's going okay and regulation hasn't stopped their business or a, the partner hasn't stolen their money yet or, you know, nothing bad has happened yet. You know, everything is happy. So they don't really dwell upon it, but they're not really successful long term, meaning they're always going to have to hustle and grind to the next best thing with a small bump in the road. And so one of the things I would encourage your listeners to do is sooner than later, get enough reserves get enough capital uh, in your business so that you, you can weather any storm, right? And that's two years. And so some people think that's extreme. I talked to someone just the other day and they're like, two years, damn, come on, man. I mean, I've heard of a six month fund, you know, even a one year, one year uh, reserve, but two damn years, like, yeah, I mean, think about it. Most successful people never have to work in their life again to make sure their quality of life is sustained. So Two years is not asking too much from someone who's up and coming, because if you strive to be someone who never has to work again, then that's cool. But remember, ultra wealthy people, they don't have to work for the rest of their lives, but also their children don't have to work. And also their children's children don't have to work because there's foundations in place. There's real wealth. There's what's called familial generational wealth. Now, hey, some people don't think that far. And that's okay. You're not Chinese. You don't think in, you know, hundred year increments, right? You're not a Chinese manufacturer or a Chinese firm. That's what they do. They think, you know, hundred years into the future, man, they don't play around. In this society in the US where everyone's uh, instant, it needs to be now. Oh my goodness. My Uber is five minutes away. Two, five minutes. I have to wait five minutes. It's too long. Start throwing this little fit like a little kid, you know, give it a second, right? So people are too instant. People want instant gratification nowadays. And they, you know, here I am to remind them, kind of get you by the shoulders and this listener and kind of whisper into your ear, hey man, it's okay. Don't be so quick to demand instant success. It does take a little bit of time and you do have to massively work at it. And yes, you should have some capital reserves and yes, you should have a corporation in place and you should have asset protection in place and you should do things like the, like the wealthy do it, right? So anyway, um, hopefully that kind of opens up your listeners' eyes to a different area of business than what they're normally just used to looking at. Right. That's great advice. And uh, listening and doing what the real wealthy people do, the millionaire next door, not the rich and famous who you know, are famous because they're famous. Hey, uh, you and I were having a conversation not long ago about uh, vehicles. And you were telling me about, um, you know, you have, you have friends that have really fancy cars, sports cars and so forth. And then you asked me a a question and you said, Hey, what car is one of your dream cars? Right. I remember this. So we were at a barbecue with a friend in Burbank and you asked me that question. And I I remember my answer was like, you know, I don't, I don't really, uh, 
I don't really daydream about cars, man. And I think if you if you ask me that same question, like uh, maybe twenty years ago, I would have said, yeah, Ferrari, you know, Lamborghini, Rolls Royce, Bentley, this and that. And the the truth is, and I I uh, pondered that when we left the barbecue, I was in the car and I was driving, and my lady asked me, she's like, hey, what are you thinking about? And I'm like, I was thinking about like my dream car, like what is my dream car? And uh, I remember thinking, I want a car that no one looks at twice. I want a vehicle that makes me the gray man. And what I mean by the gray man is, uh, it's a law enforcement term that police use. The gray man is the person who you don't look twice at, the person who blends in. Just think of someone wearing gray and just kind of, you know, painter's pants, like some worker guy, just walking around town. Like, you don't really look twice, right? And that's what I've always uh, strived to be as the gray man. Not the man who says, hey, look at my yellow Ferrari. Look at me and hear my exhaust because I have made it and I'm flipping you off and I have flip you off money. And I want you to know about it because I'm so insecure that your validation will complete my life, right? Come on, dude. So, and I, and I told my lady that I said, you know, my dream car is right now I drive a Lincoln. Okay. I just was in the dealership the other day because I'm getting a, the new Lincoln. I think the continental, uh, because it's a car that no one looks twice at. It's a car that, you know, you see in the street and you're like, whatever, dude, whatever, man, what's that? You know, who cares? I like that because I don't want anyone to know who's inside. I don't want anyone to know that the person driving the car has, you know, tens of millions of dollars of purchasing power, you know, that can buy buildings, um, office buildings, apartment buildings. I don't want them to know that, man. My, my safety is too important to be flaunting fancy stuff at people so that you're only going to get the attention from people that don't even matter. And that's the truth. So I want your podcast listeners to realize, yes, it's nice to strive for the things because they're rewards, right? They're, they're little rewards that you can give yourself, right? Like the nice watch, like the, the nice car, but I want it to happen in a certain way. For example, if you're going to get yourself a nice watch, make sure the company that you started, that you, you know, your corporation, make sure it gives you that watch as maybe like a safety award because you didn't get a paper cut in a whole year. And then the company buys you the watch, which is a full write-off for the company and you're an officer of the company. So it's a gift to you from your own company and it's good. You know, then that's fine, right? You, you get a nice watch, but even the watch, I would say, I, I know super wealthy people that I see, uh, you know, at the Wynn Resort in Vegas, my lady, uh, we're always in Vegas. We, we spent uh, over half the year in, in Vegas, uh, mostly for taxation reasons, um, but that's, you know, our primary residence in, in Las Vegas. So over half the year. And so I see people that I know are wearing a $500,000 watch, but I know what it is, but most people don't know what it is, right? It's a like, nice, like, uh, you know, Patek Philippe Tourbillon or a nice uh, annual calendar, uh, and a beautiful, you know, white gold. It looks very classy, but it looks like a Timex from across the room, right? No one cares. I love that. And most wealthy people that your podcast listeners are going to meet I'm talking about the people who are taking, you know, the private jets at the fixed base operators, FBOs, the private jet terminals, the people who are beyond the car thing, right? That are beyond the fancy gold watch thing, you know, because you do graduate. And I want people to know that, that the people that are making a little bit of money, these are the people who want to make everyone aware that they have a little bit of money. Then the people, when you start making, probably when you're you have about $5 million net worth. You, you have a home, it's paid. Uh, maybe you have a couple investment properties. You have you know, a bunch of money in the bank. That's when you start toning things down. But you are familiar with the city of Glendale, California, right? And I was in Glendale at the Lincoln dealership the other day. And the whole time I was, I was driving around, and I, I kept seeing people that were just making a little bit of money, right? With the fancy cars and this and that. And, you know, and I talked to the uh, the guy who does my financing and he says, yeah, you know, they, they come in here and they have five cars under their name, but, you know, they can't really make the payments sometimes. And it's just, it's sad, but they're so driven by image that it creates a, a really bad cycle of keeping up with the Joneses. It's, it's really sad, man. I think people, if they break away from the mold of having to fit into a certain parameter of like, hey, you know, I need to have this kind of vehicle, this kind of clothes, this kind of belt buckle, this kind of shoes. If you can start getting away from that and you start getting in tune with who you are and your core values and your real calling in life, then you won't have to continuously hustle to just feed the image that you've already portrayed to your friends that you can't risk losing because they'll find out who you really are 
and maybe who you really are is being an imposter or a fraud. And you can't have that. So you continue to perpetuate simple little businesses that spit out a little bit of money here and there, but you're always hustling. I think we all know people that are always hustling. They make a bunch of money, then they lose it or something happens and then they start over and then they bankrupt, they get a new investor and then they close the shop and then they open another shop. And it's just a, it doesn't really need to happen that way. But when you start buying into what you believe wealth is supposed to look like, then you always need a certain level of money to feed that wealth because then your image is gone. Heaven forbid people see who you truly are and the fact that you have to go back to a Honda Civic and you have to lose your BMW lease, you know, ooh, that, how's my family going to, how's that going to reflect on my family? And I, I think just people have to kind of step away and stop thinking about that. I met someone recently who was so scared of tainting their family image that they were scared to go off on their own and start a business because they needed to keep their job because they didn't want to hurt the family, even though they hated the job and they hated what it did to them health wise and the hours and their social life was suffering. And they were just like, I, I can't, I can't leave because I have an image to uphold because my family will disown me. And I'm like, you know, you need to stop. Do you're a grown man. You need to stop thinking about hurting people's feelings because you're sacrificing your life for someone else's benefit who at the end of the day, doesn't really care and probably wouldn't bail you out anyway if you were in debt or if you were in a situation, they might not bail you out anyway. So what are you doing? People can only give you advice based on their own fears and failures and insecurities in life. So with those people that are telling you, oh, be careful, honey, be careful. Don't, no, 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 you don't, you do not want to start your own business. Oh, it's, oh, those kind of businesses don't do well. And that just means that they're stuck in a paradigm that tells them that, Businesses don't fail. So my first question to them would be, um, hey, Aunt Jude, when did you decide that yogurt shops fail? When did you decide that? Because you saw one close down the street. Do you know the history? Do you know why they closed? Do you know if there was a family feud? Do you know if the, if the husband left the wife and it was a family business and they had to close it to dissolve it in the, in the uh, divorce? I mean, what do you really know about what's going on? And when did you decide that it was a wrong move? When did you decide to be so negative? In other words, when did you decide to stop fueling your dreams and your childlike unstoppable self? And that's what it really comes down to. I think people, they stop dreaming and they stop feeling like they're, um, they're capable because you know they have a minimum payments now. They have rent. They have car payment. They have insurance. And so it stops them. Reality sets in. And now they, they can't dream as much. They might still dream and daydream here and there. Oh, I might win the lotto. Oh, if I got my payout. Oh, what's the payout? Oh, it's a hundred. Oh, but yeah, but they're going to withhold the taxes. Okay. Well, I'm going to take home. Okay. So 59 million. Okay. What am I going to do with that? Okay. You can dream all you want. Right. And that's cool, but don't dream too much that it becomes a, uh, an actual alternate virtual reality. And then you, you think you're, uh, you think you have it already and then you don't work towards it. So I just, I would just caution you uh, and, and ca caution those listeners that if they've ever found themselves taking advice from people that are limited thinkers, even from yourself, uh, thinking in that virtual altered reality of like, oh, well, I have a nice car. I have my bills paid. Um, I'm good. It's Friday. Let's go party. You know, are you really there yet? So reevaluate, step back. Do you have two years of payments in place? If not, do you have six months? And if not, you know, what do you have? So you need to take inventory before you know what to do. In other words, when I'm about to buy an apartment building, we need to take a look at not only the current rents, but what is the history of the rents? Because sellers of buildings are liars. They always are trying to inflate and paint a pretty picture, right? So I don't care so much about what they say because I'm going to do my own research. And in the research, the true details find out because I take inventory. I take a look deep. And so if I'm going to look at someone and help them, I'm going to take an inventory and I'm going to take a look at their dreams. I'm going to take a look at their limited uh, thinking or their negative emotions. And uh, I, I can tell people that life is a constant battle of insecurities and self-esteem. This is why people drive themselves to get a car prematurely before they need the big car. Because I, you know, I, I talking to someone the other day who uh, is becoming a private consulting client. And in my intake with them, they said, Hey, I just bought a car. It's a thousand dollars a month. And instead of me telling them that's a dumb move, man, instead of me saying that to them, I said, Oh, that's excellent. You're going to learn a great lesson having done that. 
I, I'm glad you're doing that now because you're still young enough that you're going to realize in about two years that the car's old, it's not worth even half, and it's going to teach you a wonderful lesson that I actually learned early on myself. And you know, sometimes you can't tell people what to, uh, you know, what to do necessarily. Sometimes they have to experience it and hurt themselves a little bit, bang themselves up a little bit, slap themselves around a little bit. And hopefully your, your listeners don't have to get slapped around too much by their own mistakes. And uh, hopefully they come to class like the Business Codex. Hopefully they continue to listen to you. And when and if you do offer a, a live um, symposium or a workshop or something else for them to continue to learn with, then I would hope that they would take action and continue to be inspired because it's all about taking inventory, man. You know, what are you doing? What's going on? And then only then can you go in the right direction because if you don't have a full picture, then you have no business taking off, right? If you were a pilot, if you don't know what the weather is, why would you take off, right? If you don't know where the winds are coming from, if you haven't asked permission for air traffic controller, if you haven't done, uh, you know, you, you haven't really done your due diligence on the flight, why would you take off? The analogy is, why would you start a business without having a good financial picture and goals set up for yourself? So hopefully that helps. Absolutely. It definitely helps me personally. Since you mentioned cars, uh, and actually it was on my mind, I wanted to talk about that. As you brought it up, it goes to show that we're on the same page I've been guilty of craving higher, you know, a nice highline vehicle. Yeah. 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 For example, we were talking during that barbecue, for example, and I, I mentioned to you that my dream car, not dream car, but I've been craving Bentley GT Continental convertible. And oh, beautiful car. After I learned from you throughout the years, you know, the mindset that you teach, I had to get that out of my system. So now most of my time I drive a simple car that is a, gray man car so that it blends in nicely. Yeah. Once in a while, you know, just to get it out of my system, I might drive a fancy car that brings a lot of attention. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, to take it a little step further for, for the benefit of your listeners, I want to let you know, I'm not against fancy vehicles. Okay. I drove a Bentley Arnage for years, man. But when I, when I met my lady, I had that car, but when I picked her up, I picked her up in a Honda Civic. Okay. I didn't even want her to know that I had a car or that I had, you know, real estate or not none of that because I didn't want to influence her in any way to like me for different reasons, right? I wanted her to see my heart. I wanted her to see my soul. I wanted, um, basically, I wanted her to fall in love with my smile, fall in love with who I am, my jokes. I didn't want her to say, I want to be driven around in a quarter of a million dollar car. This guy seems kind of cool. You know, he's kind of goofy, but. Hey, he has a nice car and uh, yeah, probably has access to nice dinners. And so I, for me, I wanted to, I didn't want to present an artificial barrier and I, I wanted to prove to myself and I wanted to, I wanted to prove love uh, that uh, it could happen organically for who I am as a spirit. Right. And so for me, that was it in business. I do the same thing, man. Like I will not drive into a building negotiation in a fancy car, man. I've been there, done that. It just doesn't draw the attention. It doesn't give me the stature that I need for negotiation. When I'm driving around town, I, uh, and I said earlier that you're only going to get the kind of attention that is not really productive to you. Like how many times are you going to impress the Starbucks barista drive through girl in your car uh, after it gets old, right? How many times do you need to impress the drive through person at In-N-Out? And how many times do you need to be do you need to be complimented at this at the red light by someone that pulls up in a in a car that is not as expensive and has you and has and asks you something like, "Hey, what do you do in life? You know, what do you do for work?" And you know, how many times you want to talk to people and and uh, have to uh, explain to them how you're able to afford this vehicle? And then also, if you're driving at night, if you after a nice dinner and you stop to get gasoline and you know the whole thing, if you don't carry a firearm. And if you don't know how to how to fight or how to evade a potential bad situation, it just draws the type of attention that I don't desire because I don't ever want to get in an altercation where I'm, you know, defending my life or I'm talking to a group of people that want to take pictures with it. And and that comes with the territory. So that's just me, man. I'm just I'm this odd character that doesn't want to be recognized. I mean, I want people to thank me for having come to class and it changed their life. For me, that means the world. Like, I want them to thank me and say, hey, hey, thanks so much, you know? And if they can say something, you know, on video that I can sh share with others, then that means the world to me, right? Like, hey, 
I came to your class. It helped me dramatically. I, I enjoyed it. I raised X amount of money. I'm, now I'm doing this. I used to do this. I'm just so happy. Thank you so much for your training. That means the world to me. Someone saying to me like, yo, that car is dope. Yo, that car is, that car is tight, man. Someone saying that to me does nothing to me. Okay. So again, I'm just an odd apple. I'm not saying that you should not go get it. I'm just saying you need to reevaluate. And when I say you, I mean your listeners. Right. If they're craving the Bentley for $2,500 a month, right? Because you can lease these vehicles for cheap and they're not pricey at all. Like that Bentley GT you were telling me about, you can get like a five year old one and uh, you can get it for probably 10,000 down and on a lease uh, and maybe uh, 1,500 bucks a month for the used one, the old generation. Then there's a new generation, probably 2,500 bucks, um, 50,000 down, 2,500 bucks, something like that. And then if you go over miles, maybe $2 a mile, you know, you could get it out of your system if you, if you want that. But I would question your listeners. Some people need validation and I'll tell you why, because they haven't met their financial goals yet. They're not wealthy yet. So if you're not wealthy yet, you need to be validated by the oohs and ahs and your friends and, oh, dude, yeah, you, you drive, man. When you roll up to the club in this car, the valet parking, you know, uh, you know, so some people do need that validation, unfortunately. So if your family doesn't give it to you, sometimes it has to come in the, in the form of a car. Look at the typical real estate agent or the typical up and comer in, you know, in business. The first thing they do is go out and get a big car because they think it, it's, uh, you know, it's good for their image. I can tell you this, that if I meet with a broker, a real estate broker who has, you know, CCIM, their, you know, designation in commercial real estate, and he pulls up in a car that is nicer than mine and has a watch that's nicer than mine, typically these guys are lazy to begin with. And it's typically not a good way to do business. I, I used to sell insurance years back. This was taught to me by an insurance, um, one of the brokers who was training me to sell insurance uh, to nurses, nurses retirement agency, right? He taught me, he says, you never, wanna, you're, he, you never want your watch to be nicer than your clients that you're trying to sell something to because you want them to feel like the king of the household because you're there to serve them and you're there to close them. So you don't want it, even though you, you probably make more money than them, right? And a lot of times that's the case. You probably are, have more assets and you know, you, you're doing well than most, most of your average clients, which was the case. I was making you know, plenty of money. And um, I, I, I was dressed down. You know, I dressed well, but I dressed down. And I dressed like a worker. And I dressed like someone who was going from appointment to appointment because I wanted, I wanted them not to give me like a pity sale, but I wanted them to know that I'm not here as an arrogant individual throwing wealth in your face. I'm here as a concerned individual because the eyes should be on the process and on the product. Your eyes shouldn't be on my watch. Your eyes shouldn't be on my cufflinks. Your eyes shouldn't be on me. Your eyes should be on what I'm selling you. And that's it. The illustration for the life insurance or for the annuity or for the, uh, you know, whatever it is that we were selling at that point. And that was, man, I, we were selling so much. And uh, he, taught, he taught me this formula. He goes, I've, I've tested it, Jorge. I've tested it. I've shown up in, you know, custom suits, French cuff, and I've, I've showed up in, you know, a nice polo shirt with a, logo of the, of the insurance company on the chest. And I close more business uh, in the polo. And so I just, you know, I've always remembered that and it makes sense, man. You know, uh, so often people want to project an image of success and, and they're not there yet. And then you get into a conversation and then the truth comes out. And then people are like, Oh, I thought you were someone else based on your image, but I guess you're not. And then it's like kind of like a letdown. It's kind of nice to be uh, understated. And then when people find out the truth, they're like, damn, I had no idea this guy had it like that. Okay, cool. I like that. You know, under the radar, I like it. Since you mentioned Marianne, let's shift gear and talk about your relationship with Marianne. You as a couple, so few couples do what you do and have developed and created, nurtured relationship as strong and as beautiful as you have. What can you tell us? What kind of advice can you tell my listener in order to help create a similar type of relationship and find the, your soulmate and have a fulfilling life as a result of this relationship? Yeah, a very important topic, man. Um, and I thank you for bringing that up because I think the, uh, your, your relationship uh, with yourself is going to dictate the type of people you attract to you. A lot of people are seeking to fill a void in their life. So they're, they're looking for an opposite person to them. Uh, luckily, when I met my lady, I was already successful so that I could focus on us. 
and I could focus on elevating her as my queen. And I think a lot of people, you know, they do that, you know, people that are married and uh, we didn't get married until later on, but our relationship from the very beginning, we met online, by the way, we met on match.com in 2005. And uh, back then I was focusing on music. I was, um, was already doing real estate, I was already doing apartment buildings, but I was focusing on a music project that I, that I uh, wanted to get out of my system. And so I recorded a music CD and, you know, sang on it and, you know, mariachi music, Mexican music. And so she knew me as the guy trying to do the music thing. That's how I projected myself to her. So I painted an image of a struggling musician so that I didn't paint an image of a successful apartment building developer and investor, right? I chose to project that image to her so that our, our relationship could be pure and founded on, on the idea that we need to work hard, we need to hustle, you know, and that type of thing. So one of the things that we've managed to do throughout the years is we get back to love very fast. Have we had arguments? Of course we have. Do they last more than 15, 20 minutes? No, they don't, because we never want to take an argument to the bed. There's no negative energy in that space. That's our sanctuary. That's our love. That's where we sleep. That's where we recharge our bodies. We get back to love very quickly. And that's because our relationship is pure based on understanding and based on real love, man. And, and I think it had to do with me hiding who I was in the beginning. And it wasn't a deceiving thing. It was to let it flow organically, to let it happen naturally. And that was my technique back then. But the letting her continue with her life ambition and with her passion. I think people should be more supportive of their spouses. You know, so often you hear that your spouse has an idea, a business idea, and then the other spouse, you know, shoots it down or maybe is not as supportive or says, you know, we can't afford it, honey. Or, you know, why would you want to do that? It's a stupid idea. Who's going to buy that? So anytime Marianne had presented an idea to me, uh, all I did was find a way to made it, make it a reality and cultivate her and edify her to make sure that she can, you know, continue to evolve uh, in terms of her dreams and, and support her in every way. So just as she supported me in the beginning with my dreams and uh, my goals and outcomes in life, I did the same thing with her. And if there was ever an argument, it was never about challenging ourselves or telling ourselves that it was never going to work. The arguments were more like based on self-esteem and not even jealousy because we're not even a jealous couple at all, at all. Uh, we've got through the uh, talking about ex relationships and all that. The biggest secret that I can share with your listeners is that no matter what happens, find a way to get back to love sooner than later. More importantly, when you are single still, right? Maybe you have not attracted uh, the love of your life to you yet, or maybe you have and you've kind of had girlfriends or boyfriends and, and maybe you've been, you know, here and there. The most important thing that I would be able to tell you as a listener is, when you can get to your core self and you can get and cultivate your core values and exude who you really are, that's when really the, um, the, the true loves and the true people that are going to help you with your outcomes, in this case, if your outcome is to find love, that's when they start presenting themselves. That's when you start recognizing it. That's when you start seeing it. That's when you just will magnetically start attracting these individuals. When you stop the BS, when you stop the fairy tale stuff, when you accept yourself and love yourself, and when you are content with where you are in life right now, when you are very happy with where you're going because you're programmed to succeed, but so you know where you're going, but you're content where you are in your current stepping stone, then your magnetism just multiplies. And that's when you can be ultra nice to people. And that's when I believe people see your heart and because you're in tune. You're not trying to be some dude. You're not trying to, you know, fake it till you make it. You're just, you, you are who you are. And you, you can talk about your true insecurities to that individual. You can talk about your true concerns. And all of a sudden you're having genuine conversations with people who end up being, who may end up being, you know, the person who you end up falling in love with. But those conversations can't be true if it's, there's superficial conversations about nothing. So a lot of times people sabotage themselves, right? For living in alternate reality, some virtual fake, fake it till you make it. You know, I don't, I don't need love. I'm, I'm going places, you know, that type of thing. So just be cautious about that. And Marianne is um, successful in her own right. She has yeah. her practice. She's passionate about physical therapy. Also, she teaches law enforcement officers and other organizations and people 
how to protect themselves, how to survive. She's known as the urban survival chick, and she also has classes on how to handle a gun. That's right. And I know you're, you're passionate about you know gun ownership. Tell me a little bit about that and how did you um, become passionate about guns? Yeah, for a lot of the a lot of the up and comers and the successful minded people, please don't forget the fact that once you have more money in your life, um, there is a possibility that you're going to become a target. Here's why: bad people don't target broke people because they can't take anything from broke people. So they'll usually go to a nicer neighborhoods, and people are very vulnerable in their homes. That's when you take your shoes off. That's when you kick your feet up. And, you know, you're very comfortable there. So uh, I believe, as my philosophy, that people should be proficient in firearms because ultimately the average 911 response time is um, right around 20 minutes nationwide, give or take, depending on where you live, right? And if you live in a nice fancy house up in the hills, then it could take uh, 45 minutes for someone to show up, right? And if you don't live in a gated community and people could walk right up to your window and, you know, throw a brick through it or open your door, you're in a very vulnerable environment, right? So I would say get some self-defense training, learn how to work a firearm. I'm not going to turn you into a gun nut. You know, you don't have to have a bunch of guns in your house like we do and guns. I have a gun here at my desk right here, right now, but you don't have to become, um, you don't have to become that person. You just need to know what's going on so that if you're not armed, if you refuse to purchase a firearm, if that guy jumps out of the bushes or the woman jumps out of the bushes and, you know, and they have a malfunction at trying to rob you, then you can at least disable the gun. You can at least fix the malfunction, defend your life. You know, there's a number of things you can do. But I think people should have a, a handgun. I like the Glock 19, Glock 17. They're both nine millimeters. They should have a rifle of some kind, some kind of AR build, a 5.56 um, AR rifle, and a shotgun. If you have those three and you're proficient in those three and your family household is proficient in them, then you're going to be good to go. So my lady and I, we have like double of everything. And... Uh, Heaven forbid someone ever, you know, tries to break in. Well, they'd have to get past the gated community, our gate, our other gates, and then our alarm systems. And then if they do, if they're stupid enough to do all that and try all that, then they have to get past, you know, the neighbor's dogs. And, you know, then they'd have to come in, in, into our place. And, you know, we have this huge yard. And, you know, I, I feel like just digging some, um, some graves so that I can just, you know, Hey, uh, this was their last stupid move. Here they lie, you know. Um, no, I'm not going to, wouldn't do that. I have to call the police, of course. But um, yeah, you have to be trained and make sure your family's trained. Because if you're the only one that's trained and the bad guy is going to target the alpha male of the group because they're going to, you're, you're going to be the one that you're the biggest threat to them because you're going to be the one that's going to fight and protect your family. So if all of a sudden, you know, they cut your arms or they cut your veins, you, you really can't use your right hand anymore. And if you're the only one with training, you're screwed. You can't use the gun anymore because you can't pick it up can't use your arm anymore because uh, you can't pull the trigger. So I believe everyone should be trained because um, anything could happen at any time. Violent crime occurs every six seconds in the U.S., according to the FBI statistics. But also, bad guys carry guns and knives. So you should at least have the minimum of what these guys have, and you should be proficient. I think you should be able to meet someone who's trying to take your life or harm you. You should meet them with greater firepower greater skills in overwhelming force. Those who have overwhelming force tend to win the fight. Uh, it goes for MMA, goes for boxing, goes for gunfights. Um, you know, that person who's determined, who comes in with the element of surprise and who comes in with a desire to succeed tends to prevail. So anyway, that's my spiel on, on firearms. I, I go get some training. I, I believe that uh, you'll just be, uh, be happier and you'll just be more comfortable knowing that you could defend your life um, if, if you needed to, but hopefully you never have to. But, uh, there's this quote that, uh, I saw many years back and the quote is beautiful. It says, I'd rather be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war because you have massive training, but you're still, and you're not going to go looking for fights, but you can defend your life and your families because heaven forbid someone tries to harm you or your family. You need to be able to respond with precision. Absolutely. And I've learned that from you over the years. And we've been to many trainings, both uh, handgun and other types of guns. On the Instagram, you posted something, a picture of your desk. On the desk, there is a AR-15, Air France, right? Yeah. And next to it, there's a Business Centurion magazine. Yes. And then right in the middle, there's a box. The box, it says Cohiba Behike. <laughs> yes. Nice cigars, man. 
Tell me about the cigars and your relationship with cigars. How did it start? Why did you start having cigars? So um, I think everyone should start smoking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, listen, we, we use cigars as a, as a business tool. All right. And also as a winding down, relaxing, decompression tool, right? And most of the uh, people who are, who are wealthy on the golf course, who are uh, developers, uh, who are, who do big deals. You know, the, the biggest thing you see in movies and in history is like, hey, we closed this deal. We landed this client. The baby's born. Here's the cigars, right? And so the biggest celebration tool that's out there is in history has been cigars, right? And we closed the deal. Here we go. And so a couple of years back, we became really enamored with the idea. And my first cigar was pretty gross. Didn't even like it. I was like, ugh, this is nasty. And then I got sweaty and I was dizzy and I got what's called a nicotine rush, even though you're not inhaling. Uh, it's a nice, fine tobacco, you know, long leaf filler tobacco uh, in a nice cigar, smoked right and smoked completely can give you a really nice, uh, relaxing state of mind, right? Because it's through the natural nicotine. And so I've experienced this and I didn't like it in the beginning. And I remember thinking, why would people do this? But then I started realizing, hey, I wasn't smoking the right cigar for me at that time. I needed to smoke a different type of cigar. So when you talk about that picture, the Cohiba Bejique, Cuban cigars, that is a Cuban cigar. And, and the Bejique was always like the chief in the village. And so Cohiba is a brand. Bejique is the type of cigar. And it's uh, pretty much the crown jewel of the Cohiba brand. And a Bejique in history, if you look it up, it's literally the chief that uh, when you would go smoke a peace pipe with the chief uh, from your village to another, or you were visiting heads of state, uh, you would talk to the Bejique of the tribe. And so they would do like a peace pipe thing. So that's what it signifies. And so uh, Cuban cigars tend to be very light, tend to be light to medium smokes because in Cuba or, you know, people that are influenced by Cuban culture, these guys smoking all day, every day, they'll smoke five, four or five cigars a day. So they can't be smoking medium to full cigars all day. So they smoke their Cuban blends, which are light to mild to medium. And so that's one of the things people will realize that they talk about Ooh, Cuban cigars. Ooh, you must be fancy. It's like, no, you just must like a nice buttery light cigar. That's wonderful to smoke. And that's not going to jack you up and make you uncomfortable as you smoke. It's going to be a joy to smoke. It's going to smoke nice and cool, you know, so that the smoke that enters your body, that enters your mouth isn't really hot. When you take a look at the effects of smoking, um, you know, nicotine and so forth, like cigarettes, the bad part is not necessarily the nicotine uh, although sure it's addicting, blah, blah, blah. The worst part because smokers of cigarettes are inhaling is the temperature of the smoke. That's what's causing all that black stuff. That's what's ruining your lungs. That's what's ruining your tissues is you're introducing hot air into your lungs all day, every day. People are smoking, you know, 12 cigarettes and cigars is different. You don't inhale and you're not puffing a lot. If you're doing it right and you have a nice cigar, you're puffing once every three minutes, every five minutes even, and your cigar is not going to turn off. So it is a business tool. I don't encourage people to start smoking just because they want to use it as a business tool, but it's kind of nice to know that if you are sitting there with a big wig and they happen to love cigars, they can tell you and I can tell you that it's difficult to find a good friend to have a nice cigar with. That's why people generally smoke by themselves because there's just a lot of people who don't understand the culture, who don't understand why you'd want a nice whiskey with a cigar because when you drink a sip of the whiskey and you have the cigar, the whiskey is resetting your palate of course, it can happen with a Coca-Cola. You know, it doesn't have to be a whiskey. It can be a soda or Coca-Cola or something like that. And it's resetting your palate in between smokes so that you doesn't affect you as much and it's more enjoyable. Same thing could be done with a little chocolate or M&Ms or, you know, a nice Belgian chocolate or something. You know, introduce a little piece of chocolate into your mouth while smoking. It's just a wonderful experience. So anyway, again, it's just a business tool. When else are you going to be stuck with someone for 45 minutes to an hour enjoying a cigar, something that you both enjoy? And you're either at a golf course or at a nice, you know, whiskey bar or something, and you're having a conversation. And guess what? Generally with cigars, just like on the golf course, people's walls come down. So if they're generally a high powered executive, once you switch to cigars, now they're just, you know, Joe, the guy who sells millions of dollars worth of a product. Then you, you can have a real conversation with that individual. That's how we use it, right? We like to break down and get to the real individual and have conversations about just the family about life, about their last vacation, about why why they why they like Las Vegas, what their best show, you know, different things. Instead of just trying to make a sale, it happens organically because guess what? You're forming a friendship first, 
And then the sale is going to happen almost guaranteed on its own organically. But that's because they like you and you're a friend and you're an ally and you're a confidant because you smoke cigars together. And so you're in a different category now. You're in the inner circle. So that's how we use it. And that's how, you know, someone can use it in the future if they choose to choose to do that. I know you love cigars too. So, and I know that you don't smoke too often, but um, you're probably in the same category like me. It's kind of tough to find people that are high quality people that also love to smoke and, you know, cause they're busy. So it's kind of hard to, to reunite, right? I can't agree with you more, Jorge. Yes. I love to smoke cigars. Not that often, maybe once a month, twice a month, but with good company. Yeah. And if I smoke a cigar, I want to smoke a good quality oh, cigar. Yeah. I'd rather smoke one good cigar, one Bejique, for example, yeah. or one Cuban cigar, instead of smoking five or 10 cigars. Yeah. And just like you described, that specific example, the other day I was at the center club. Yeah. We've been there many times at dinners. Afterwards, we have cigars. After the dinner, outside, I met a person. He was smoking a cigar and we started talking about cigars. And because I'm knowledgeable and I've, you know, I've smoked cigars, I know what I like, what I don't like. We, we had a great conversation. Here you have someone, an executive who consults Sony, AT&T, Costco, you name it. I mean, big companies. And we had a great conversation. We built a different kind of bond. That's right. It was just, you know, different experience. Yeah. I'm not saying it's because of the cigar, but cigar kind of started the conversation. It facilitated the conversation, right? It's a, it's a common ground. It's a, you basically accelerated establishing rapport with someone, which is something critical that people need to do when they're going to engage in a conversation is establish rapport without being sneaky, without being like, ooh, hypnosis, let me copy this person, how they're breathing and their words, right? But just being natural and organic, right? You need to establish rapport. And that's probably what happened with that individual is that you have a common ground, your love for something, in this case, cigars. And then all of a sudden, this guy turned from being a high-powered executive to just another cool friend that next time you see will, is going to go out of his way to greet you. And maybe even from across the room, like, hey, what's up, Leon? What's going on, dude? What's in your, in your cigar case tonight, man? What are you smoking tonight? And it's a different level of enthusiasm instead of like, oh my goodness, here comes that guy who's going to try to sell me their thing again, right? It's, it's not like that anymore. It's more of a cool connection. That's, that's beautiful, man. It was amazing how much we had in common. Yeah. As, as you know, as friends as, and as people who just were having conversations, so many things, you know, and also cigars are good on the, on the green when golfing. I don't golf that much. I didn't like the golf, uh, the game, but you know, most people who golf also smoke. Yeah. And whenever I go golfing, uh, that's a nice add on. Yeah, Absolutely. Let's shift the gears a little bit. Talk about the way you give back and how do you view this concept of giving back? There's someone who I've heard saying, one of uh, executives, I think it was a TED Talk. He said, if you have to give back, you took too much. I know you're active with the American Red Cross. You're a volunteer at the Baker to Vegas Relay, the run competition. What is your take and philosophy on giving back? You take into, into mind the way people need assistance. And uh, it comes from my upbringing in the Masonic fraternity. So I, I became a Freemason in 2005, actually the same year that I, I met my lady. She used to drop me off at Lodge and kind of hang out either nearby or inside the Lodge room, uh, the ladies' room, and you know, kind of work on her computer and stuff. Uh, in, in Freemasonry, they teach us, uh, and I'm you're a fellow Freemason, so you understand. It's a brotherly love, relief, truth, and charity, among other things. But some of the fundamentals in, in Freemasonry have to do with just becoming a better man. And so what does that mean? Well, does it mean that you have to serve your church? Do you have to go to church? Does that mean, you know, what do you have to do? Get involved with your community? It, well, it, it really depends on how you can participate, because if you volunteer even just once a month, then you've, you've done a good thing. But I remember um, we went to the cornerstone laying ceremony of a, an outfit in downtown Los Angeles called the Midnight Mission. And I took my lady to it in 2005. They had dedicated this new building. The um, Midnight Mission is a Masonic organization. Well, it's led by Masons. And uh, they don't say it like openly. Uh, they just, it's Midnight Mission. They feed people. They feed the homeless. They help them get job training. They give them clothes. You know, they do all kinds of cool things. They have little shelters for them. And so early on, 
I wanted to, uh, to start getting more involved in the aspects of masonry. Like, Hey, how can I, you know, help serve more people? How can I become a servant of people? And, uh, as a result of serving others, can that joy help me continue in life? Or do I have enough satisfaction serving others that, uh, you know, I, I, I can have, I, I can fill that part of my life that now I can focus on other things without feeling the need to, you know, do extraordinary volunteering work or whatever. And so the Mason thing is what started it all. And so from there, I started going to the American Red Cross, uh, first donating blood and so forth. And then I started getting involved, uh, learning how to activate and open shelters in, in a disaster. Uh, I just wanted to get training. Having lived through the Northridge earthquake in Southern California, I remember thinking, wow, uh, this is scary. Uh, what do I do now? They just shut off the gas. Nothing works. Power is out. Buildings are falling down. How can I help? I can't just show up. You know, I, I felt really helpless and hopeless and thinking, uh, okay, do I have work? Do I have a job? Is the building where I work, is it still there? You know, and I remember thinking people need a help in hand at this point. And so through the midnight mission, being exposed to that, I remember um, starting to volunteer heavily and started getting like 36 different designations with the American Red Cross. And my lady and I did this together. So we'd go out on calls, disaster action team, volunteer during the week, whenever we had time, in the evenings, work night shifts, be on call. Is there a small home fire, single family fire, or an apartment building fire? We'd respond to these things. We did this for years and years. And then uh, started getting our ham radio license. And in case there's a large scale disaster, really one of the only things that's going to work is the ham radio network because they don't rely on cellular towers, none of that, right? And if you don't have power, you can still go radio to radio. And if the relays have generators, so you can go from a relay, uh, an antenna on top of a mountain to the other side of the mountain. All you need is like two nice five watt handheld radios or a nice car mounted unit. And man, you're back in communication. So I figure, hey, um, we've always been like disaster minded, like extreme, uh, extreme minded. So like, hey, we like worst case scenario minded, right? And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because we're, we want to be prepared for anything and hopefully nothing ever happens, but we do want to be prepared no matter what, you know, even if it's just losing power for, you know, five hours, we're prepared for that. And that's where it comes from, man. And, uh, I think, uh, the level of satisfaction that you're going to get as, um, as someone who's working on yourself, the level of satisfaction you're going to get is amazing. So like we volunteer at a, a kitten sanctuary where they uh, rescue kittens, you know, ki- kitty cats, you know? Um, I never knew how much joy a, a cat could bring to your life, right? It's amazing. It's like having a child, but you can leave the child, you know, and you don't, you don't, you don't have a child, which is kind of cool. But it, it brings you the same type of love and harmony it resets you. You can have a, a terrible day at work, traffic, and you could be aggravated. And you can home and then your little kitty cat is just meowing and wants food and wants love and wants to sit on your lap and wants to play. And it's a beautiful thing. So if you can find a way to bring more joy to your life, whether that comes from um, volunteering at a kitten sanctuary, volunteering with the American Red Cross, volunteering at a library, volunteering at a, a shelter, or at a you know a, a place that has a you know uh, children like a boys club or you know YMCA something like that, then um, it's a cool thing, man. I I do believe people should give back. Unfortunately, you know people are in the hustle and bustle of things, and they're they don't have time really for themselves, let alone to bring joy to others. And I think if we create value for others, I don't know if I quite agree with a guy who said, if you, if you want to give back, you took too much. And I'm sure there's a gimmick there and there's like a, a nice talk behind it and, you know, a nice payoff at the end. I haven't seen it, but um, uh, the, the title of it, um, just by face value, I think that if, uh, if you have to give back, that means that you are in tune with yourself and you have enough love and respect in your life for yourself that you now want to shine it on others. And in the form of, of giving back, meaning you become a prism of light and you now want to shine your, um, your experiences and your heart on other people. And you're going to do it by maybe just ladling some soup into their bowl or, or helping them pick out a suit for their job interview because they're homeless and they want to get a job and you are volunteering at a, at a shelter, you know, you know, whatever that is, you find a way to be true to yourself and it's just going to help you become more congruent, man. You know, earlier we were talking about love and that's the word that I, uh, that I didn't mention, but it's everything. When you become more congruent with yourself, when you become more true to yourself and honest with yourself is when people can respect the real you and will recognize the real you, including that girl that you like, or that guy that you like, or the guy that you want to, to notice you or, 
you know, the girl that you want to get the attention of, you know, the more congruent you are, the more you'll shine. So yeah, it kind of goes hand in hand. Beautiful. That's a wonderful thing. And on this positive note, let's conclude today's episode. Jorge, thank you very much for your time today, for the, all the value that, that you gave us, all the lessons and the, your tips and advice that you shared with us. Tell us briefly, where can our listener get in touch with you if you, they want to find out more, they, they have questions, they want to get in contact with you? Yeah, we mentioned some of the stories and uh, it was a great opportunity to talk to your people uh, about just my experience, you know, my limited experience on this planet, right? And uh, I, I believe it'll have some nice impact and you know, hopefully so. In order to look at some of the pictures that you mentioned and also kind of peer into my life, Instagram is a great way to kind of peer into, into a snapshot of different experiences. And that's quite simply, it's just my name. It's Jorge Bueno, number one, uh, J-O-R-G-E-B-U-E-N-O and the number one. That's on Instagram, you know, poke around. There's a bunch of pictures on there and some goofy captions many times. And then um, you'll meet my lovely lady, Marianne. You'll see, uh, you know, some of our experiences and stuff there. And um, the other place is thebusinesscodex.com. It's a website, thebusinesscodex.com. So I enjoyed our time, Leon. It was great being here with you and uh, we'll connect soon. We'll have some cigars soon. And uh, I look forward to listening to uh, some of your other cool people that you're inviting onto your show. And uh, it's always a lot of fun. This was episode 11, the second part of the interview with Jorge Bueno. Check out episode 10 for the first part of this interview. And there we have it. Another amazing guest has visited our club. Make sure to subscribe to the Thriving Life Club podcast on your favorite app. Simply go to thrivinglifeclub.com slash and the name of your favorite platform. iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube... You get the point. You will find the show notes, the episode freebie, and the resources mentioned during the episode by navigating your browser to thrivinglifeclub.com slash and the number of this episode. For example, for the episode three, you would go to thrivinglifeclub.com slash number three. For the episode seven, you would go to thrivinglifeclub.com slash number seven. We want to make this podcast the number one podcast on iTunes in its category. When you feel inspired, head over to iTunes and give us a quick review to keep the podcast commercial free and get it discovered by more people like you and families like yours. Rate and review the podcast on iTunes and share it with your friends. Let's inspire more people together. And until the next episode, just remember, start where you are, use what you have, Do what you can, live a thriving life.